Hey, Mr. Faka, I'm so glad to be able to invite you today uh, for our talk. And as you know, earlier when we were talking, whenever we do this kind of shows, we get a lot of people listening and watching us, maybe not at the same time, but later, because we do want to learn something from you. So first, can you introduce yourself to our listeners and audiences? Thank you so much for the invitation. I appreciate it, Ms. Wong. My name is Gabriel Vaca, and I'm bicultural and bilingual. I speak Spanish and English. And I've been living in the United States for 40 years, and I'm president and CEO of Vaca International. Yes. And tell me what your job is, what made you want to start your own practice, and what's your level of education, and what propelled you to become who you are today? Oh, thank you so much. That's a great question. It's a broad question. Um, you know, I... I um, uh, I have uh, the reason I mentioned bicultural and bilingual because, like many of your your folks that you help and, and, and today, is I have a, a, a country um, bilingual identity crisis that I've had for 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 several years because I was born in Mexico City, but before I was a year old, I went to that, lived in the United States in Washington D.C. My dad worked for the United Nations. And when I was 11 years old, uh, my family decided to move back to Mexico City. But I went there with no Spanish at all because my life was in English, even though my parents uh, are from Mexico. And I started my, my um, from 11 years old to, to start to learn Spanish. And I, I lived there till I was, uh, did my, my uh, college degree. And I started to work as a sales manager. I always wanted to be in sales. And at that time, I did not, that's what my first identity crisis happened because I did not want to live in Mexico City. It's a big country, it's a lot of people, but I wanted to come back to the United States. So I sold everything I had, a classic immigrant story, very classic. I sold everything I had. I came with uh, my wife. I did not have kids at the time and some money in, the, in, in, in my wallet and some suitcases. And I started an entrepreneurship in the United States. That's how I started. And I started doing an import export distribution. And that's how I started my first small business uh, that way. And how old were you at that time? I was 28 years old when I came to the United States, 28 with a college degree and the know-how of uh, how to do business. But my know-how of how to do business was the Mexican way. It was not the US way. So that was a big struggle for me and, and how to understand business in the United States. And this is what I tell a lot of people. Yes, you do business in, in Asia, you do business in Europe, in Germany or, or Latin America, but it's different. It's mm -hmm. different how you do business in this country, like all countries. So, so what I did was the first thing I, I did, because I'm Hispanic, I went to the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce locally in Indiana, where I moved, and they taught me everything. And I got a mentor and I got people that would help me. So I recommend in my top five list of things to do for people that are immigrants that come to this country to work and to start a business is to join an organization, join and find a mentor. They will teach you how to do business because you cannot do business as you did in your country. It's not the way to do it. You have to learn the culture. You have to learn the way uh, you, you're going to be dealing with. Great. And talking about that, may I ask you maybe a stupid question? And everybody I ask is a, is a different answer. How do you define Latino versus Hispanic versus Central America versus South America versus Mexican? Um, if I see someone on the street, what do I, are you Latino? Are you Hispanic? Are you Mexican? I mean, what's a better way to ask them? Well, you know, um, Hispanic and Latino are the same thing, number one, but Latinos like me and others like to be called Latinos. The Hispanic is a US word that was coined by Ronald Reagan in the seventies for the census. It's a, it's a, that's what they called it because it's Hispaniola, but Latinos want to be called Latinos. That's why there's a lot of organization called Hispanic, and that's fine. 
Latino. I use the word Latino and most of what I do is Latino. And now they have the new one, which is called the Latin X, but I still use Latino um, a lot. And so that's what you should call it. If you see somebody, you call them Latino, but you're in a formal setting, like uh, for legal, like what you're in your business, it is Hispanic because that's part of the census. Got it. And may I ask for first gen, a lot of, especially uh, Latino people, especially Mexicans, the kids, like they'll go back when they're two years old, they come back when they're seven years old, they'll go back again because their parents were traveling back and forth, especially in the early days. How do you reconcile and how, like for example, I mentor quite a few 20 some year old, 30 some year old kids. And I always ask them, do you count in Spanish or do you count in English? Do you <laughs> dream in Spanish or do you? So when you dream, how do you dream? When you count, how do you count? And is that okay to count in our own languages? Like when I think of phone numbers, I always think in, in Chinese. You're right, right. No, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very fun question. And, and it is defined depending on how long have you lived and which is your predominant language. Because uh, when I came, when I went to Mexico, when I was 11 years old my, and my two brothers, and I have a sister, our whole conversations were in English for about five, seven years. And then we started to switch into Spanish because of our, because everything's in Spanish. So, when I came to the United States, I started to do everything in Spanish, but then I switched again to English. So I've had those transformations and that's what I would tell the 20 year olds and the kids that are seven coming back and forth. It depends on what you're doing business in. Like you, 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 you count in Chinese. I count in English. Mm -hmm. I dream in Spanish sometimes. Yes, I do because there's things that, that from the past. So it's, it's a very fun question because people ask me that also, well, do you dream of Spanish? Well, I, I dream in both because of the, the what happened in my childhood and, and, and it was in Spanish, English. So it depends on the memories you have. <laughs> mm -hmm. And also people, I'm from Hong Kong, but of course Hong Kong went back to China. So I'm right. very much in tune to the Far East and you're in tune to the Latino countries. May I ask you this question? So when we do business, like for example, I have Chinese friends who wants to do business. And now there's a lot of Chinese because of the communist China. They are getting Mexican passports now because then it's easier for them to get visas, they can get TN visas and e-visa, which China right. don't have. So if they want to start a business in Mexico, what's the difference between Mexico, let's assume Argentina and Brazil? So should they, and I, I shouldn't ask you because you probably prefer Mexico, but so what country it's, how is it different? Well, it's, it's very different. It's like coming to the United States and having a business here, like what I did. Because I have, you know, I, I've had several businesses here in the United States. Um, this is maybe my fourth or fifth business that I started. But in Mexico, the business is different. Again, what I recommend everybody, the difference is business is done differently. Like it's done in Hong Kong, like it's done in Germany, like it's done in Mexico and Argentina. Even though people speak Spanish in Latin America, but my Spanish in the words, especially the technical words, are different in Venezuela than Argentina, than Mexico. So, um, for example, you know, I, I, I'm involved with the, uh, the, the Hispanic community here in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I was on the board of the Georgia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And when the pandemic hit, we had the PPP, the PPP-1 and the PPP-2 payroll protection plan. Everything was in English. However, we did, we put on maybe six or seven programs on how to fill those forms in Spanish. But the forms were in English because they did not have the forms in, 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 Spanish, in Spanish. They were in English. So we had to teach people because their English is not 100%. Their English may be 70, 30, 40%. So we taught them in Spanish how to fill the stuff that's in English. <laughs> so you could see there that culture and, and language, and especially the technical language, is very, very difficult for all countries in the world. 
Yes. And also, because it's only in the past maybe five, six, eight years that I started having translators, we're really having a thriving Latino practice with the immigration work, with you know, just advising them, mentoring them. Right. So and before then it's always with the Russians, the Indians, the Chinese, the different parts of the world, the Middle Eastern. And I noticed even in the Latino countries, there's a big difference in culture. Like uh Cubans are so different from Haitians. Dominicans, of course, look down on the hate, just like us, right? The Chinese look down on us. I don't even want to name it. I'll get paid letters. But right. so we have that uh, level. So from someone like me, who's really not that involved in, even though I do support a lot of their cultures, what can you teach us or me and our listeners how to differentiate certain things you just don't say to certain Latino people, like? Uh, I heard, I read in the newspaper that um, a president or someone important made a gaffe in in Mexico or something saying about how uh, certain type of people came from Spain, which is of course white, and certain people are indigenous, which is of course dark. And we have the same problem in, in, in China because we like white skin, the light skin yes. is that marker. So can you advise us how to treat, how, how to do this? Yes, that, that's a great question. And there was a snafu because I think that was the president, and, and, and I'm not gonna say the country because of your audience, but there was somebody that said that the, Sp the, the Spanish would come on a horse and the other ones would come from indigenous, and it, it uh, really, uh, so, so I would say this, uh, to be fair with everybody, you treat everybody with respect, with kindness, like you wanna be treated. And if you have, trouble with words if you have trouble of where they came from you do not address that you address people by their name just like your culture is like where you want to be treated so that's what i do i've done business around the world because i worked for ups for 24 years all i did was international business everything i did was international business so i dealt with asia i dealt with canada latin america and europe and and i dealt with all my partners and to be respectful, I always talk business and I always very, was very cordial. I did not say any and get in into any, any issues of hierarchies, nothing at all. Stay away from that if you don't know. It's very difficult. But once you go in um, and you start make, doing relationships like I had, I traveled to Mexico a lot in my business with UPS. Uh, I got to know the people because I'm, my culture is Latino, is Mexican. But if I go to Europe, I would know that the, I would not be able to, to, to understand that culture. I went to Europe a lot, uh, but I was very cordial there because I did not understand it. So if you treat things with kindness, like you want to be treated, I think you'll be okay. Okay. Another question I have, which I face in our practice a lot, is that certain cultures, they respect age, which for me is good because I am 71 years old. And so <laughs> even when I was younger, I'll tell them I'm older. You know, so I've been 65 years old forever. So now I tell them I'm not yet 71. I will be. So I always <laughs> like to make myself older because your culture and my culture, we respect age, we respect grandmothers. But in the Western culture, they're normally more loud because they're more individuals versus the Asian culture. So if you are having like tea or a business negotiation on a round table, we always defer to the person on your right first and on your left and in front of you. So there's a way we do business. And I know the same, especially with more Mexican people, the more educated they are, the more like they're very, uh, they're more, humble they're very kind um versus more people who is more you know tight because they tell you exactly what they want they expect so and so from you like in five minutes you're like whoa whoa whoa, whoa, whoa stop you know let me let me take a breath i want to see what you want me to do <laughs> so how do you but on the on the other hand being a white male I think you are luckier than I am because I am an Asian Chinese woman. So I, when I'm humble, people see me as a nobody, you know? So I'm like, whoa, 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 stop. I am a great lawyer. I am, look at my, I use my juries to hide my insecurity. So as a white male who really, who had worked for UPS, you know, that's a big company. How do you see women like us, like the Indian women, not so much the Russians or Ukrainians because they are white, but Asian women or even Mexican women uh, that's sort of despised um, 
know. Yes, so, and, and that's a, yeah. that's a great question because it's about cultural again. We're going back to the culture part because the Latin American people, uh, we're brought up in, in my culture that you respect everybody that's elder. The police you respect, you you, yes. you respect the, the 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 business person, you respect A the teacher, teacher, the teacher yeah. you respect professors, so yeah. You 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 grow up that way, and regardless if they're wrong, you still respect them. Mm -hmm. The Asian culture is similar. Mm -hmm. I understand that. And there's other cultures. The US culture is about individuality. Mm -hmm. Our culture is about team, like you said. Mm -hmm. So I have applied in my U.S. business, I continue to apply as teamwork all the time. And it worked out for me. So when, when, it, when I start any company, I always have a board of advisors. Regardless of the size, I always bring in men, women, age for free. I don't need to pay them. They love to be on a board. I have a meeting every quarter. And I talk to them on the phone all the time and said, hey, what do you think about this? And it doesn't matter the age. People like to give advice. They love to give advice. So when I if I if I set up these 10 people, five or whatever, and call them, they are feel part of a team, which is different because even at a big corporation, like you said, that I worked, um, I had another identity crisis because, yes, I am white, but I'm Latino. My skin is white, but I'm Latino. However, I was in a male-dominated company for many years. It's different now. And I had an identity crisis because I said, I don't fit here. Even though I, could, I look American, I have my tie and everything. So I started a Latino employee group at UPS called Crecer. And... That changed my world to have all the employees of Latinos to work on community work, mentoring work. So that's how we created the culture again of teamwork rather than individually. And with the majority of people are here are millennials in this in the Latino groups in corporations. Their majority are millennials, which I love. So I was part of them and they consider me a mentor, et cetera, et cetera. But that's how I dealt with that that whole issue about individualism and, and, and teamwork and yes. team people. Another thing, another problem that I face as a community person in especially Cleveland, Ohio, because it's a smaller city and us on the, and Columbus, Ohio, is we have a big divide. Most Chinese in these older cities, and I'm sure it happens in Chicago because we also have an office in Chicago, is either most of us, uh, not even because in those days, Chinese don't become lawyers. So I'm like the first or second lawyer in the whole city, you know? Wow. So, but of course, now we have more Chinese, but not because we're Pakistanis, we're Indians and stuff. So my question to you is, as a, and a person who was tr struggling between both worlds, and I'm like you, I came when I was 19, but I didn't have your luxury of coming here at one and left at 11 because I had to learn everything new. So right. did it, we have a lot of, like, especially uh, Chinese professors who are great and like published more than 100 articles. But we also have Chinese, more business owners in Chinese restaurants or waiters. But for a smaller city, we still, we're very humble. We get together with potluck. It doesn't matter your wealth because when it comes to our communities, we know our hierarchy. Normally, it's the older Chinese who sits at the back, who's a male, who controls the environment. It doesn't matter, you know, I could be a lawyer, my friend could be a doctor, but ultimately he controls it. So in your community, how do you look at the caste system internally? Because my same with the African-American culture is the mainstream doesn't really know who the leaders are. They always go to the African-American who they think is a leader. And same with us, people, a lot of people think, oh, this is a Chinese leader, leader, this is a Latino. But in our own community, we know who our leaders are. So do you face that and how do you deal yes, with it? Yes, absolutely. We face that all the time in the Latino community here in Atlanta and in Georgia or any. I belong to the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And these are national. And you've got a lot of awards from all those places thank, because thank I have you. your CV right here. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. So, so in these organizations, is still the hierarchy is there absolutely 
Um, from a business perspective, you always go to the elders. You always go to the ones that will provide the mentoring and the counseling because they have a lot of years of experience. So that's from the business side. But from the social side and the family side, it's still the same. So they repeat what happened in their countries in Mexico, Argentina, Spain. It's family oriented and they have the father, the mother, and they, they're respected. Um, the elders, brothers, they're all respected. The same family nucleus is repeated here in the United States and I'm, I guess around the world. But what my I get invited to a lot of social parties and it's the same thing. The elders are the ones that are respected and they're the pillars of the business or of the community. We see a lot of family businesses, just like we have in the countries in Latin America, in the U.S., in the U.S., and I'm, I'm not trying to stereotype, but in the U.S., uh, there's not the, there are family companies, but the Latinos have a lot of family company businesses, and they always bring in the family, and they always give the business to. That's right. It's always children. in the family, right? Yeah, right. it's always in the family, and I see that happening here also. The same thing, because as you know, the number one minority in the United States is Latinos. That's the number one more. There's more Latinos than African American in the United States. However, the businesses, there's three to one on, on businesses that are opened by Latinos versus non-Latinos. The problem is that they don't grow as much as they should like the non-Latino businesses to, let's say, a million dollars or more. They don't grow as much because of lack of education and lack of resources for, for, for uh, financial. And I know we're talking a little bit about business here, but but I see the same thing happening and it's repeated from those countries into the United States. Yes, and I think in the past 30 years, the interesting thing is in the same Chinese and Korean culture, it, the Koreans actually started first because of Second World War and then 51 right. and 53 North Korean wars and stuff. And then Korea is Philippines is American, that's in the 40s. But the Korean people who came to America in the 60s, because Color Quota Act came in 65, and I'm sorry, Latino people are not involved because Latino <laughs> people is considered white. That uh, That's a, a wow, well, it's life. It is what it is. Right, right, right. 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 So, <laughs> The Korean children became wonderful writers, wonderful thought thinkers. But then the Chinese start coming in with Kitzinger in 72 and 78. And, you know, so for our community, I always felt the Korean children may have excelled faster than the Chinese children because it's just because when they came, they normally have grocery stores. So the children were... Uh, exposed to businesses. Most Chinese, they came, they came professors or writers. So the children, as, and I think my our children sort of spoiled because the Chinese, we sort of pamper them. We don't want them to work. We want them to get A's and, and A plus. If you get an A, they say, why did you get an A plus? I'm like, what? So um, in the Latino culture, what do you think is becoming of a lot of people who came after 97 and now they have children who will be 20, 21, 22, and also the DACA kids. And I think those kids are awesome. But what yes. do you see in the future for these yes, kids? Yes, I, I, see, I see it continuing because it happened in the crisis, the, the, the financial crisis uh, in the 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, and now it's happening again after the pandemic of, 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 of Latinos opening more businesses than any segment in the United States. Mm -hmm. Why are they opening businesses? Because they have that creativity and they want to open businesses. People are coming and, and maybe you see it in your practice. They want to come to the United States because the, 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 the most important thing is the rule of law that exists in this country. Mm -hmm. the, ru the rule of law is very interesting. And uh, so when they come here, and when the, they open these businesses, they don't want to wait for that job or that check that comes from the government. They open a business because they open a business because of survival and they need to provide to their families. Most of this Latino segment that open businesses are, are Latina women. Why Latina women? Because they want to provide to their families. And that's why it's the biggest segment of all the United States is Latina women opening businesses. The issue there is again, the organizations need to help them to for business education, provide funds for them to grow. And 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 they're not used to in their countries to go to these organizations. They don't know. 
They don't know that these organizations exist. So that's the reason why it's the fastest growing, but they need help to grow. Yes. And how do you, uh, can you explain to our people, how do you do your business? What kind of clients you help? How do we refer cases to you? Yes. Yes, that's yes. very good. So so I have two parts of my business. Um, you know, after I retired from UPS, I did retire after 24 years. Thank, uh, I, I appreciate uh, uh, UPS taking care of me. And I went to work for the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And I did a lot of programming there. And then I ran the Hispanic Business Center. And it was focused on providing education to, to Hispanic businesses and and. Um, I, 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 I ended that last year and I started Vaca International and I do pro bono work like you do pro bono work uh, for small startups as well as growing businesses. And I also have uh, clients that I, I obviously I work with uh, every day that that uh, provide a uh, Vaca International some some revenue. So I do both of those type of work. So if there's a small bit, I'm a certified business mentor. So I could help in Spanish companies because I know their English is not 100%. I can do it in Spanish or in English. And you can refer to my email that's shown on the screen for people to contact me. And then also clients that are a little bit larger, uh, I could help them with business plans, sales, marketing, financial, new branding, on and on and on. That is the truth is it is once you follow a plan, you, you 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 will be successful if you work on these plans, because businesses today, which I know for all my experience, uh, start a business, but they don't have the structure mm -hmm. that they require to be able to 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 grow and have the fundamentals. And that's what I do to help them in business plan structure, sales, marketing on just the fundamentals. And I think once you have them, you could grow. And with that, thank you, Mr. Vodka. So, thank you um, and thank you. And uh, our listeners, again, if you need anything, call my friend here, and I'm sure he'll be happy to help you. Thank and you so thank much, uh, Ms. Wong. I appreciate the invitation. Thank you.